Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mohaddes Abdul Hosseini, PhD student in civil engineering at University of Toronto and chair of environmental sustainability committee here at Massey College. It's my privilege to welcome you to today's Massey Dialogue event on plastic policy in Canada. Today, together with my colleagues, we're excited to engage in meaningful dialogue about the pressing issue of plastic pollution and explore actionable solutions for our with our distinguished panelists. Plastic pollution remains one of the most critical environmental challenges of our time, impacting ecosystems worldwide and demanding urgent attention. This event provides an opportunity to delve into Canada's initiatives on plastics, including extended, produ extended producer responsibility, bans on single-use items, and ongoing international efforts through the United Nations Environment Programme. Our goal is to foster greater understanding and collaboration to ensure the sustainability of our country and planet for future generations. As a students and future leaders, it's essential that we embrace sustainability as a core value. By actively advocating for responsible practices and policies, we have the power to ignite the meaningful change and pave the way for a healthier planet for generations to come. At this moment, I extend heartfelt thanks to all our esteemed guests, speakers, and attendees for joining us in this crucial conversation. Your presence reflects a shared commitment to addressing environmental challenges and advancing sustainable practices. I'm grateful to, Ma to Massey College for its instrumental support in organizing and hosting this event. And I'd like to express my deepest appreciation to acting principal, Jonathan Rose, for his invaluable support and encouragement in making today possible. Without further ado, I invite Principal Rose to deliver the opening welcome remarks and land acknowledgement. We're honored to have his insights and perspectives kickstart today's dialogue. Please join me in welcoming Principal Rose. Thank you. Thanks, Mohi. I don't have a lot of uh, opening remarks, but I'm, I'm glad to see so many people coming to attend. And, and thank you so much to the panelists for having this really important discussion on plastics policy in Canada. I'd like to acknowledge that Massey College is built on land where many Indigenous peoples have lived. It is on the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as well as the tra traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. We want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward this, the land and the great privilege that we have to work on this land. And now I'll hand it over to uh, Alison DeCruz. Alison. Yes, thank you so much, Principal Rose, for your support. Uh, and now I'm going to be, I'm Alison. I am a junior fellow at Massey College, and I'm also a PhD student studying higher education at OIC. And today I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator. So here goes. So, Alice Zhu is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto studying plastic pollution. She uses a combination of field sampling, laboratory analysis, and statistical modeling to answer questions pertaining to the sources, transport, and fate of uh, plastics, plastic pollution in the environment. Her work is influencing plastics policy locally and globally. She's heavily involved in climate and waste advocacy in her community. Over the years, she has hosted numerous town halls, conferences, panel events, workshops, and rallies on the climate crisis, and also appeared in two documentaries about the climate movement. She led the creation of an international video series on plastic pollution with the University of Toronto trash team. And she has been invited to give numerous guest seminars and lectures on her plastic pollution work at prestigious institutions, including the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, University of British Columbia, Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, California State Polytechnic University, Humboldt and Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Alice is the co-founder and research director of the Plastic and Climate Project, which seeks to quantitatively elucidate the impact of plastic pollution on climate change. For her research excellence and environmental leadership, she's the recipient of a Vanier Canada Graduate Scholarship 
and was named a top 30 under 30 sustainability leader of 2023 by corporate nights. Wow. Well, today, Alice will be moderating what promises to be a very engaging panel discussion, judging by the caliber on the panel out here. And I'll hand it over to Alice to introduce our panelists and begin the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alison and Mohi, for the wonderful remarks and Principal Rose. So now we will begin uh, with the panel. And as Mohi alluded to, um, just want to add a little bit more to get you all hyped up about plastic pollution. Um, so our society has an addiction to plastic. Plastic is used in every aspect of our lives, and it is not going to go away anytime soon. However, the sheer amount of plastic leaking into our environment warrants better management of this material and circular decisions being made higher up in the supply chain. Plastic poses a myriad of risks to ecosystems, wildlife, and human beings. And there's an urgent need to explore solutions to, the, to this multifaceted issue. There's no one obvious silver bullet to solve plastic pollution. It requires people, community, government, and industry working together. It requires consideration of the social, political, economic, health, and environmental dimensions of plastic, and involves both individual and systemic change. An international agreement on plastic pollution is currently being negotiated. In fact, the fourth session of negotiations will be taking place in Ottawa at the end of this month. It now is the time to engage in earnest dialogue on this issue with fellow Canadians, explore solutions with experts, and help ensure the sustainability of our country and our planet for our generation and future generations. With that, I'd like to welcome you to this panel event and introduce today's panelists. So Dr. Chelsea Rockman is an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto. Dr. Rockman is a world-renowned expert on plastic pollution. She has studied the sources, fate, and ecological implications of plastic pollution for multiple decades. She is also the co-founder of the University of Toronto Trash Team, an organization that strives to increase waste literacy while reducing plastic pollution in the local community. Welcome, Chelsea. Thank you. And uh, we have Joanne St. Goddard. Um, Joanne has served as the executive director of Canada's premier environmental non-governmental organization, Circular Innovation Council, formerly Recycling Council of Ontario since 2001. She has over 20 years of experience in the areas of public policy design, corporate strategy and compliance, research and pilot innovations designed to accelerate Canada's transition towards a circular economy. Joanne has worked with senior levels in both government and business, facilitating unique private and public sector partnerships that advance policies and practices that deliver our on carbon emissions and waste reduction objectives. Welcome, Joanne. Thank you. Finally, joining us online, we have Member of Parliament, Julie <laughs> DeBruzen. Hi. Um, Julie is a Member of Parliament for Toronto Danforth and has been since 2015. Mr. Brucen is the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Energy and Natural Resources. Parliamentary Secretary De Brucen has previously advocated for a ban on single-use plastic items in Canada and also helps lead Canada's green building strategy and zero plastic waste by 2030 initiatives. Welcome, Julie. Um, let's give a round of applause to all our panelists. <laughs> Great to have you here. So here's the format for the panel. We'll begin with pre-written questions from me for the panelists for the first half. Then for the latter half, we will open the floor to questions from the audience. And questions from the audience will alternate between online and in-person um, questions. With the, we will then end the event with a reception where you can mingle and ask any lingering questions you may have subject to the availability of our speakers. <laughs> a couple of logistical notes. Um, this event is being live streamed and a recording will be made available on Massey's YouTube channel after the fact. If you're not comfortable with being recorded, it is up to you whether you'd like to remain in the room. So now I'll ask questions that are geared towards a specific, a specific panelist um, to all panelists or um, to any panelist who chooses to answer. For questions geared towards a specific panelist, once uh, the panelist has finished the answer, others can feel free to add on to the question. Um, answer. <laughs> uh, with that, let's begin. 
Mm -hmm. So just so we settle into the panel, uh, and before I grill you with hard questions, <laughs> let's hear a bit about um, their panelists, um, their background and history. Um, oh, sorry, background and story. How did each of you get involved in your current roles? So uh, why don't we begin with Chelsea? Begin with me. Okay. So for me, uh, I got interested in plastic pollution actually when I was studying, when I was a student in school. I would say that. Uh, seems kind of cliche, but I was interested in waste as a kid. And then when I went to undergrad, I did a study abroad in Australia. And we were working um, basically on an island called Stradbrook Island, which no one really lives there. It's just a research station. And at the research station, they were rescuing turtles who were there basically just to excrete plastic in order to be able to go back into sea. And then there was plastic all over the beach. And my uh, professor at the time gave us this project that was just write a research proposal. If you could write any research proposal in the world, what would you do? And I was really interested in the plastic on the beach and these turtles that were sick with plastic. And I started Google plastic and ocean. And this was 2006 and I came across the garbage patch. So the garbage patch was introduced to the world in 2006 and an um, LA Times series that actually won a Pulitzer Prize. And so I started learning about that. I started look, looking in the literature. There were like, I don't know, maybe 10 papers on plastic that came up on the time. A few were on microplastic. I was really interested in that, the small stuff. So I wrote a proposal that was, how do microplastics impact fish? And then I was stuck with it. And so when I finished undergrad, I said, I'm going to go to grad school, and I want to better understand this. I want to increase the information so that facts can inform policy. And so I applied to graduate programs. And I studied how plastic affects fish for grad school, and I still study how plastic affects fish, as well as other things. So that's me. Great, thanks. Yeah. Okay. I'm next. Um, well, my trajectory was uh, quite a bit different than Dr. Rojman. I knew nothing about environmental issues, uh, was not interested in environmental policy in generally. Uh, plastic was not uh, an item of issue or an, a, a subject of, 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 of issue at that time. Uh, back in 2000, I was brought on to the Recycling Council of Ontario at that time because it was a fledgling non-for-profit organization that was trying to figure out its place between public sector policy and the intersection between the industry, which were uh, a group of... of, of um, really at the time to be, to be blunt and fair, packaging uh, manufacturers and brand holders who were interested in really um, having government slow regulation. Uh, and so they came together to try to form voluntary programs. And my role was to try to broker uh, agreements, voluntary agreements between the public sector government at the time that was thinking about regulating and these industries who were really trying to, as a group, stay regulation or minimize it. And that was the beginning of, of my tenure 20 years ago. Uh, but once I started to understand that intersection um, and really the puts and takes of how to regulate as a government and the way that business comes to these discussions. Um, and at the time, it was really just a garbage discussion. It was more about recycling and who should pay for, for it. And, and it was because our landfills were, were filling, uh, no discussions really specifically on plastics as a matter. So from there, I was hooked on the policy development. It's a very active and dynamic space. It still is today and growing. Um, and I think for me, there was no tie-in whatsoever to carbon and carbon emissions. Um, and climate change wasn't a term, which is almost embarrassing to say now. It sort of dates me, uh, but but this was really, you know, the burgeoning, um, I, I guess, these discussions about environmental policy and, 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 and their infancy and, and where it's grown today is, is just really exponential. Great, thanks. And Julie? Thank you. Well, I come at this a little bit differently, but... Yeah. Um, I became a member of parliament after really working with community organizations. So I worked with um, organizations like Park People, a lot of places that were um, local food banks, farmers markets, trying to protect green spaces in our city. And that's where I started with the Earth Day cleanups and that kind of thing, just noticing more of what was in our space as a community member. and. After I was elected, I became parliamentary secretary to environment and climate change. But even before that, I started getting involved in trying to take action on single-use plastics. A lot of that was actually brought forward by community members too. It kind of came from 
the local cleanups, I think there's a lot to be said for getting community members to see on the ground the impacts of things like the, with the plastic waste we have around us. Um, but then people were coming into my office and talking about things like like the low rate of uh, plastic recycling. We got to meet uh, Chelsea or Dr. Rochman over there to go and see the lab and find out more about the work that was happening. And so I think there's a lot that my role came from community involvement and, and making sure that the public was really engaged on these issues. And that's, that's how I ended up here. But then in two weeks, I'm going to be at INC4 on the global plastic waste negotiations. So started in park cleanups and now working more on an international scale and on uh, what our government does. Great. Thanks so much for sharing. So we're going to launch into the questions. Um, the first question is for Julie. So I wanted to follow up on what you said about the sing your efforts to um, tackle single-use plastics. So I know that the federal government introduced a ban on six types of single-use plastic items um, as early as 2020 or 2021, I believe. <laughs> She's loading. <laughs> She's tweeting herself. No. <laughs> um, oh, no, okay. Uh, I finished I'm voting. We're good. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh, so um, I was alluding to the federal government's um, implementation of the ban on six types of single-use plastic items as early as 2021, I think. I heard about it. Um, so the six items are checkout bags, cutlery, food service wear, ring carriers, stir sticks, and straws. Uh, but I still see these plastic items everywhere. And uh, I'm just wondering if you can update us on what is happening with this ban. Yeah, um, so the uh, plastic ban and the regulations. Okay, first of all, sorry, can I just explain just for anyone who didn't understand why I was holding up my phone um, to my face because that might be a little bit confusing. Um, I'm voting as we go. We have some votes right now in the House of Commons and I can vote virtually. Now there's facial recognition on my phone. So you're gonna see me do it one more time and, uh, and I apologize for that, but that's what was going on in the background. Um, on the ban on single-use plastics, there were two phases to it. The first phase was that uh, we could not manufacture or import uh, single those six single-use plastics. And then the second phase is that you couldn't sell it. Really, it's the runoff of product that people have that so that you once plastics are there, they're still going to be using them they just because they're already there. So it's not going to really change anything if they throw them out directly or whether they use them. Um, but I also think it's really worth highlighting and it's a conversation to have. I can't really comment on it too much, but uh, there was a lawsuit that was brought by the chemical industries um, and certain provinces intervened to, to actually knock out those regulations. So as much as they're really popular in communities, and I, I hear a lot about people really wanting them, um, they were challenged in the courts and it's actually in the courts right now. So I'm somewhat limited on what I can say. Mm, okay. Thanks so much. Uh, so does that mean, uh, as a quick follow-up, does that mean that um, currently the companies are still not allowed to manufacture them? So, um, but they're still allowed to sell them. So under the regulations, both phases actually came into effect already. Okay. So, so both of them, so that you shouldn't be able to um, to be selling those products under the regulations. The first phase was, I think you had the right date, 2021, and then it was 2022, which was the second date to the end of 2022. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to have to get my years right because now I get a little confused. But so you have the two. So we passed the date for sale um, already mm -hmm. for the regulations. But like I said, there's a court, there's a court case right now that might govern things up. Mm. Okay, so the fate of the regulations hang in the balance. Fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, um, thanks so much for that. And then next question is for Joanne. Uh, so sometimes it can feel hopeless when we're grocery shopping mm -hmm. and we see all of our groceries wrapped in plastic. We don't want to support plastic packaging, but we need to put food on the table. Where are there opportunities for intervention in the plastic life cycle and in the supply, ch supply chain earlier on before products reach supermarkets? Oh boy, that's a juicy one. <laughs> I could fill a whole hour with that. Um, 
well, I, I think the sentiment of the first part of your question is really important for us to not forget that as consumers and purchasers, we really drive the decision in terms of, of how much plastic in what form and, and uh, that we allow our encourage industry to utilize. There is some practicality around packaging. I'll say that as a, as a, as a sector, of course, it, it, it's necessary. Um, but I think that um, the ubiquitous nature um, that plastic has become the go-to package um, is, is really at the heart of the problem. It's cheap, it's very flexible, and, and comes in seven different very handy forms. Um, and if you're the brand holder or the manufacturer and doesn't have to pay for the end of fate or the management of end of life, um, it really there's really a lot of, of uh, economic reasons, costing reasons why you want to use it. Um, there's also... Um, so, so I think there is, there is the change has to come from, from many areas. Industry pays very close attention, despite what we might feel as consumers. They're always trying to take the pulse of their consumer. And so don't underestimate your purchasing choice. Um, sometimes we feel we don't have choice at store. All the cucumbers are wrapped in plastic and you wonder why. Express that. I would say express that to your store manager write an email into the company, take five minutes or 10 minutes to do that. It does make a difference. There is some, a human being at the other end of that. And the more mounting comments that these manufacturers and in particular the grocery retailers get from their consumer, um, the more motivated they are to sort of make change. What I can say is that there, and what is hopeful, um, is that there are many, many, many initiatives going on almost at the same time where Producers are and manufacturers are examining their pla their their packaging choices. Um, they may be looking at alternatives. They may actually be looking if they need a package. They may be looking for alternatives to a plastic, and they may be making better choices if they want to go with plastics. They're really informing themselves and educating themselves around plastics that may be more durable, more recyclable, and they are making those changes. But when you're talking about a global marketplace where supply chains come from all over the world, especially if you think about fresh produce, when you live in a country like Canada where we have long winters, maybe not this one, but generally we do, we're importing a lot of fresh produce. And so that needs to have some kind of package to protect it and to, and to, uh, to withstand long distances. But what I can say is with the advent or introduction of producer responsibility legislation, which has the manufacturers extend their responsibility for paying and at the end of life costs, they are motivated because it comes off their bottom line. And they're working, many of them are working very hard with their supply chains to see what's the art of the possible. Thanks for sharing that. It's good to know that um, there's hope in consumers having an effect yeah. on what industry does. Can I yeah. add one yeah. there where you can yeah, say something more? Yeah. Just onto that that connects to the last question is I think a lot of people think of the policy as the single-use plastic ban, but there were other components to that. And one is the extended producer responsibility that you mentioned, um, which would extend that ideally across the country. Um, and then also some uh, standards around recyclability. So the, the legislation, I guess, that is currently, what was the word you used, hanging in the balance uh, has a lot more to it than just the single use plastic ban and it includes some of these things that we're talking about around packaging and single and um, extended producer responsibility oh, that's really um, great. Yeah. Can, can i just jump in quickly too though on one piece because i thought the part about your voice being important i think is something that we need to keep to keep bringing up and just as an example like the single use plastics wasn't in our platform when we ran in 2015 but before the next election, we had already committed to a single-use plastics ban, and that was largely because people in communities wrote letters and raised the issue, right? But we sometimes, I think, underestimate the importance of our voice in getting things done. And I agree that I see, even in local stores and restaurants, choices that were made regardless of any kind of law or regulation because they know that that's what their customers would prefer to see. So it, there is... I'm not, I'm not defaulting to individual responsibility here. I do think that there's a role that government needs to do and, and industry needs to do. 
but but your voice matters on both those fronts too. Thanks for adding to that, Julie. And um, following up on the extended producer responsibility mm. part that you mentioned, um, so I know that there's some EPR um, policies going on. For for instance, the Ontario Blue Box program is has contributions from industry, and also. Um, Another famous example of EPR is the beer store. So they, um, you can return your bottles um, and get a deposit back from the beer store. But I'm wondering if um, you can give, some, give us some more examples of EPR initiatives that are happening or you would like to see happen. Yeah, there's so many. Um, so there's, I think, 11 out of 13. So waste is a provincial jurisdiction. From a, from a management perspective, to just to differentiate the, the, their jurisdictional, policy jurisdictional issues uh, or, or um, tools. So the provincial governments across the country have uh, the legislative power to introduce producer responsibility, and they are. 11 out of 13 provinces and territories now have some form of producer responsibility. The way that the statute gets formed in the framework, they pick it off uh, or they designate it by product category. So many of them have packaging as a product category. They require producers of packaging and those brand holders that use packaging to um, fund recycling programs and to extend their operational responsibility to, to uh, either pay for and manage the packaging at end of life. Um, and plastics is part of the packaging category, but there are producer responsibility legislations in other product categories as well. ICT equipment, scrap tires, used oil, um, hazardous materials. So the way that the statute works is the government chooses what product category it wants to use the policy tool towards, and then it designates it by definition through that through that piece of legislation. And then any brand holder that's defined by the regulation and sells the product that's defined in the regulation is then becomes responsible for the targets that are prescribed in the statute. So there are producer responsibility legislations very actively. Some are in maturing and in transition, and that's the case in Ontario. Some are introducing new but um, as I mentioned, 11 out of 13 now have some kind of form of EPR. And, and we're sort of the bridesmaid to EPR globally. It was actually um, created in Europe and in the Scandinavian area of, of Europe first, trickled down into the European Union, and now they've got it, um, um, all, all 26 member states have some kind of form of EPR, and then Canada picked it up about 10 years after that. And we've been working on it for the better part of about 25 years. So when I spoke in my introduction about public and private partnerships, it is those negotiations that happen between the private sector and the public sector and, and that, that formed the producer responsibility legislation. So it's here to stay and it will continue to mature. Um, but without producer responsibility, it means you and I pay as taxpayers. So before producer responsibility, we all in our taxes would pay to our local municipality who would then run our garbage or recycling programs. And we were 100% paying for that through taxes. So the overarching goal of producer responsibility is to have those industries that are closest to the choices of product design and packaging types to actually take on that responsibility and lift that cost from local government who at the end of the day are the furthest actor in the supply chain. They have no role in what product design or packaging choice a brand holder makes. So that's really the policy intent and the thinking behind it. So for Ontario, by way of an example, it meant $300 million that was saved by municipalities um, when it was created. And that was a cost share model, 50-50. Industry is now taking on the whole entire bill, which is about $700 million. So this is not a small market shift. These are big dollars that mean big things to both the local governments as well as businesses. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm sure that uh, you might have more questions to ask about sure, this yeah. later on. So yeah. Uh, right now, we'll move on to um, another very hot topic these days, <laughs> bioplastic. Um, so this question, uh, I would like to start with Chelsea. So biodegradable plastics and more mm -hmm. generally bioplastics 
are often touted as a solution to conventional plastic. However, it reinforces the single-use consumer culture. Um, is it a false solution? To me, it feels like the plastic equivalent of carbon capture and storage, unproven, uh, unclear efficacy, and potentially a delay tactic. Do you think there's still a role for bioplastics to play in our toolbox of solutions? Yeah, so I saw that you were asking me this and I thought, oh. Uh, so I think, I guess I'll start by saying that bioplastics and biodegradable, people use these terms wrong a lot. So anything is a bioplastic, and correct me if I say something wrong, uh, that is made out of, um, I guess, well, plastics are usually made out of fossil fuels, so these would be plastics that are made out of, say, ethanol, uh, leftover what is it like the husks from corn so it's using biological materials that are not fossil fuels in order to make plastics this is a bioplastic bioplastic doesn't mean that it biodegrades then if a plastic biodegrades it can biodegrade industrially so like when you go to um fresh or some restaurant that sells you a, what it says compostable bpi compostable plastic that means it has to go to an industrial compost facility you can't just put it in your backyard garden and so that means the city has to have an industrial compost facility. Toronto does not. Um, so I, I'll come back to that in a second. But you can truly have a biodegradable plastic that actually is, there's a plastic called PHA and PHB that I believe are made by marine microbes and broken back down by marine microbes. So I guess the first thing is we need to get the terms right. Um, and then not do something called greenwashing, which I'm going to hold that thought because I feel like Alice might ask a question about that later. So I'll save the PLA uh, going back to fresh and I can talk about that later. Um, but do I think there's a role for it? So I think, I think that there's a diverse toolbox for plastic pollution. I think it is a wicked problem and there's a lot of different solutions that we need to turn on at the same time. So is there a role for bioplastics? Maybe if it's used in such a way that it's not a regrettable substitution and maybe it truly is biodegradable. So maybe for something like contact lenses where we're probably not gonna get away from using these single use items and throwing them away, they, but maybe they can actually biodegrade and disappear. So I feel like it is not, I don't wanna like throw it off the table, but I think at the moment we're using it wrong and potentially using it to greenwash, which I think we'll come back to later and please correct me i feel like you know more about this than i do okay <laughs> yeah that's, thanks for bringing that up um yeah. there are some I, just want to note that I think that there's something there to be said about the role of scientists and all this too to help guide us on us right like to to get us around the greenwashing we need we need the actual science and facts uh which is where where we rely on on people who can actually analyze that and give us a better idea because as you said it can be pretty it can be broad, pretty broad and confusing and i do think um there can be some garden paths that we get led down so i think that's where we really need the experts to be able to help guide policy yeah these, this is a great discussion and i want to follow up on <laughs> the green green washing. Washing part. <laughs> um so there's a lot of greenwashing in society. Everywhere you look, plastic bags that say 100% recycled material on them, containers that, well, if recycling actually worked, that would be good. I mean, well, we can talk about that later. Um, containers that have been, um, containers that have the words green and bioplastic on them. And even the term circular economy has been uh, assigned radically different uh, definitions by different people. Um, which raises the question, um, which results in confusion as to whether industry that are circular are part of the solution or not when they use the term. Um, I'm wondering if there's any advice, um, any panelists can answer this question, that you can give Canadians on how to deal with greenwashing. Can I start because I already... Oh, yeah. I totally. st accidentally... Well, I, yeah, I started it before. So, go, so I guess going back to the PLA or the BPI compostable plastic, so basically, we work with a lot of restaurants right now to kind of help them try to think about how can you reduce single-use plastic items. And a lot of them are switching to this BPI compostable plastic because I think, as Julie said earlier, customers want to see the switch in material. So they're trying to do the right thing. They're actually paying more for this material. And I don't think it's that they're trying to be sneaky. I think they also don't realize that maybe it's not a better material here in Toronto. So in Toronto, we don't have an industrial compost facility. That material has to go in the black bin. So is it better for material to go to landfill or is it better to get a plastic material that's truly recyclable and go in the blue bin? 
I don't know, we could discuss the question, or to actually get a truly compostable, you know, cardboard type of material that doesn't have a plastic wax that can go in the green bin. So unfortunately, that is a great example of greenwashing, where even the business is now paying more money to buy these materials. Now, I contacted Fresh, I'm sorry if anyone here works for Fresh, a long time ago when they made the switch, and I said to them, you know, you're spending more money for something that's actually not better. And they said, our customers want it. And they, keep, they kept doing it. So my opinion of greenwashing, to go back to what Julie just said, is I truly do believe that facts and truth should be guiding and informing decisions. And this is why we started the U of T trash team, was to increase waste literacy around waste in order to inform fact-based and um, informed solutions. And so, you know, in some ways, bioplastic could be good. In some sectors, biodegradable could work. But the reality is we need to understand. And greenwashing the public is just... It's kind of heartbreaking from someone who's a researcher who feels that you know it's important to follow the science. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. There may be two things that I might add to that excellent comment. I think there is a role for government here in standardizing the industry. Um, it's very confusing for governments or for for consumers and the public to keep up. Um, companies have R&D departments that work on this 24-7 and they come out with new things all the time. So it's virtually impossible to try to keep up with, with developments, whether they are good or bad, in terms of packaging design. Um, so I think there is a role here for government to try to simplify it for us and for them to only allow certain things that we know at the end of the day are actually going to be less harmful on the production side. Don't forget there's a whole production area in terms of how to make that. There's an impact in terms of, of making the packaging itself or the plastic itself, using it and then disposing of it. Sometimes we just think about the disposal part of it. So um, I think it's, that's a really important role for government to play. The other piece that I might say that we all have a role in and maybe restaurants the size of Fresh, is, is look at alternatives. It's not about, maybe there's something that you can do that doesn't require a package. We're doing some experiments right now, pulling together some of Canadians' biggest grocers around reusable packaging in the grocery store. And we've worked with them for about a year and a half. And a half. They've all given us money. They gave us money to try this experiment. We're going to be launching it in Ottawa during INC4 in three grocery stores. This is where it's going to start. And we challenged them to pick one thing in store where they didn't use any disposable packaging, where they moved to reuse. They got to choose. One chose the hot case, one chose the deli, and the other one chose um, a self-served salad bar. But this whole idea of can you find alternatives that we know customers are looking for and and to get away from packaging altogether so remembering that packaging is designed and delivered globally but it is managed locally so if we can find solutions that that remove that local burden altogether that's really where rubber is going to hit the road so i think sometimes we get funneled into these choices is this good is paper good is plastic better is this type of plastic better and we forget to broaden our lens to think, well, what's the art of the possible around not having a package? Can we start there and then whittle our way down to evaluating what kind of packaging is better? Thanks. Yeah, I read about the Ottawa pilot program on yeah. your website. It's very exciting. We're excited. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for sharing that. Um, and uh, speaking of disposal methods, <laughs> I want to move on to recycling. Mm -hmm. um, also very hot topic. Um, so pre recently, studies have found that only 9% of plastic is recycled. Um, and uh, this has led experts to label this end-of-life treatment as a myth. Um, so my question is, how can we increase the rate of recycling? Or should it be increased? Um, or would efforts be better put towards reducing waste in the first place? And um, in addition, should mechanical recycling or chemical recycling be prioritized? If um, Either of them are uh, better than the other. Are you aiming that at me? Uh, You're looking at me. Well, I feel like first. I need to. Okay. So <laughs> the answer to all of that is yes. <laughs> um, 
I, I can absolutely unequivocally say that recycling is not a myth. There is extraordinary investment and really great things happening in a Canadian context and we shouldn't get down on ourselves and our achievements. Um, so 9% is a very low number. That's specific to plastics. Lots of work to be done. But in order for us to get to the other 81%, 82%, where's my math? Um, we have to do all of the things that are just mentioned. We have to avoid and reduce. We have to standardize the types of plastics that can be mechanically recycled. We have to put R&D and investment into other forms of recycling, advanced chemicals, there's different names, about uh, uh, breaking down um, to back to chemical compounds so that we can produce new plastic from old plastic, all of those things. If we think about how ubiquitously we use plastic, it's not just packaging. It's in all kinds of forms and all kinds of products. So the lift is big. So it's not one of those activities that we, that we need to engage in, given the imperative of today of how much pollution there is and how it is affecting our health, wildlife, environmental issues, and social issues. We have to double down on all of those solutions. So, um, and we need a re regulatory backstop to do that. And we also need industry leadership to, to move forward. And I think, um, and we, we have to, as consumers and voters, do not take the pressure off. Utilize everything we have. The problem is big. Yeah. Can I use my comment to ask Joanne a follow-up question? Yeah. <laughs> She's so I, loud. I didn't well, hear that in the rules. I, I was thinking about this uh, when you were talking about EPR as well. So it is my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, that when industry goes to produce a product, they don't necessarily have to think about the end of life of that bottle or packaging or whatever it is. They just think about, does it fit the use? So could there be, an, and one of the reasons why recycling doesn't work is because sometimes you have a product that has mixed material or it's made out of a plastic where there's no end of life market, right? So we're not, that means the producer's not thinking, how can I make a material that fits in an existing recycle market and can practically be recycled? So could you, my question is, could you use the extended producer responsibility schemes that we're producing to basically say to a consumer, well, that you have an incentive, you can pay less if you make a product that fits in this scheme and you think about end of life and you have to pay more if you don't or could we i guess could we use epr as a way to try to get to what it is you're talking about i mean that that's the intent of epr to internalize have business internalize the cost that was otherwise externalized and paid for by you and i through our municipalities as i've described previously mm -hmm. so the whole intent of this is if we extend your responsibility and you internalize the cost of end of life management that will be incentive enough for you to examine those costs and say oh, i'm going to design differently going to choose different materials or I'm going to lightweight or whatever the, whatever the strategy is. It's a question of price point. Mm -hmm. for, is that price point big enough for the industries to shift the design? And that's really, you know, that's really the stress test around that. But what I can tell you is that when Canada does it and Europe does it and the United States does it and Argentina does it and Brazil does it, when all of those jurisdictions introduce this the bill starts to mount. And, and that coupled with the fact that consumers expect better, those two pressures are number one and number two. And all of the industries that I work with, that's what they look for. So um, I don't know that producer responsibility is the right policy tool necessarily to differentiate, but what producer responsibility does do is try to come up with a cost that per material type that the industry plays. So many of these brand holders have several different packaging, metal, paper, plastics. Typically the plastics would, fee would be the highest and the metal fee would be the lowest. And that modulation, we call it in the industry, that differentiation in the, in the cost back to the, it, back to the manufacturer, the brand holder, is the financial signal. If I produce in this material, I can look at my EPR schedule and go, oh, that one's cheaper than this one. Maybe this is, this is the way that we try to send signals back to them that it'll be cheaper if you make alternative choices. And if you can go without or you can go into reuse, you have no fee. So we try, but it's, it's mm -hmm. not an exact science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's helpful. Um, I really, if I, I'm sorry, I keep jumping in from over here, but, but if that's okay, I, I think that what, what um, Joanne was just saying though about 
if so many countries around the world start doing it, it changes the business case is really important as to why um, the INC negotiations on global plastic waste treaties is so important because Canada is doing actually a fair bit where we're among the most ambitious um, countries, but we're also a very small country in a very small market. And it is way more helpful for, for us if we have other countries who are also following the same suit. And that's, I, that's where the international treaty, I'm not usually someone who focuses on the international as much as the domestic, but on this one, I think it'll really make it easier for us to get what we wanted to get done here to have other countries around the world signing on. Great, thank you so much. So with that, um, we have, we're halfway through the panel. And I'd like to open up the floor to audiences' questions. And we'll alternate between um, live audience and online questions. OK, so uh, we have a question right here. I'm a, I'm a member of Stop Plastic. Oh, can you please speak into yeah. the microphone? Oh, OK, sure. Oh, thank you. I'm a member of Stop Plastics. I don't think this mic is working. Oh, okay, so it is working. And I have these postcards here, and um, this is for to go to the federal government. And we realize that the uh, single-use plastic ban has largely been accomplished, but now we need to get rid of all disposables, and we need manufacturers to um, to uh, stop producing plastic. So, if anyone wants to sign our postcard, please see us. But if I can jump in um, just on that, because I, I think, first of all, thank you for that, because I think it's really important to, uh, to make sure that the voice and the pressure keeps going. But I do want to highlight that like, the, it has to be all of these pieces coming together when we were talking about extended producer responsibility, all of those pieces as well, because I, you know, there is. A lawsuit, the lawsuit is actually a really big deal as far as the single use plastics ban, right? And and so we really need to be able to, to first of all, galvanize people across our country to say that this is what they want. And and I also think it's really important to, to make sure that we get international partners on the same page as much as we can, because that shows a growing market for things. I'll give an example too, by the way, like uh, plastic stir sticks for coffee, um, that was a really big thing. It's part of the single use plastics ban. It's, that's one thing I saw disappear right away. Like I, I rarely see them, right? And I think that we just need to make it a better business case too, and make it really easy for, for companies to make those choices. But I, I, take, I, take, the, I take the postcards and I'm, I'm sure that I will see them soon. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions online? Not no, not online. Okay, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll keep going with a live audience. Um, so I guess I have a question. I, I would, I would describe the blue box program in Toronto for plastics as a farce, um, given the extent of the capability of recycling, such a very small percentage. We then wind up bundling it, sending it overseas. I don't know how many people watch that program. I think it was Fifth Estate, in terms of what happens to plastic that gets sent overseas then gets transmitted to other third world countries or uh, any many many other nations and proceed to be poorly recycled at best sometimes simply burnt as a fuel source i mean if that part is farcical we would be better burying it in our own landfills in canada so that we would make sure that you know microplastics didn't wind up in the ocean, that we had some control measures in terms of leachates and so on. And, and I guess I'm surprised, I, I would also note, note the, the, the blue box program has just become under assault from the industry just today in terms where they've suddenly realized how much it's going to cost them. And, uh, and their, their immediate response is to essentially diminish the requirements for recycling in terms of how they intend to uh, uh, ameliorate some of the costs that they're now facing. So I, I mean, I think we have to be realistic here with respect to how we approach these problems that we can't offshore them. We have to look within our own markets. We can't say, oh, because Brazil's not doing it, we can't as well. It, this, is, this is, you know, we can do some things in our own country here. I, I can speak to this a little uh, in that, well, I guess the first part is the, the offshore part. So the, 
I don't know how much um, the international agreement will be about the shipping of plastic because the Basel Convention has just recently been updated to include plastic waste as part of the waste that they, um, I don't know how much of it's regulated versus just pay attention to where it is shipped. So the, the shipping of plastic around the world, people are listening. And China said, I don't want it anymore. And other countries are probably also saying, I don't want it anymore. I can't name them off because I'm not sure. But the shipping of plastic overseas, I think we will start to see decrease, which is a good thing. I think with the um, federal policy, as long as it can stay, it has a recycling standard in there that says 50% of plastics by 2030 is supposed to be made out of recycled content. Now they have to decide what plastic means under there. Um, but that the idea there is it'll drive up the plastic market. Because right now, I don't know the difference in price, and Joanne, you might, between virgin plastic and recycled plastic, but it is so much cheaper to buy virgin plastic. So you're going to want to you know, protect your bottom line and not buy recycled content. This is true too, right? So you're always gonna need some amount of virgin. So there's a lot of things wrong with recycling and I don't think any of us would dispute that. And there's a lot of things that need to fix. And even when you talk to like GFL in Toronto and say, well, how much of the stuff I put in the blue bin has a recycle market? And they were like, well, some of that stuff doesn't, but we take it and we hope one day, you know, I don't know, you can probably answer this better, it'll get recycled. But I do have hope that recycling can be part of the solution, but the whole system needs to be fundamentally I don't know, shifted, I guess. I, you should. Do you want to you take should. a different question, or do you want me? I can I try to live. I, I think <laughs> it's safe to say that um, just if I if I look at the statistics in terms of how much the blue box is collected over sales, it has plateaued over the last I would say twelve years. Um, so something new has to happen in terms of not only how much more we can collect, but then to find those markets. And your assertion that time's up in terms of export is bang on. I think the federal government is um, introducing a plastics registry uh, for this exact reason to try to get a handle on what is the movement of these collected plastics and disposed plastics. What is this movement? And so they're creating a registry that producers will have to report into as well as despite much chagrin the waste management companies as well will have to report in. And that's at that point when we start to see those numbers, we'll get a better handle on what's imported and what's exported. I won't say that export is bad. All of it's bad. We are in a global marketplace. We don't produce much here. If we can have recycled um, packaging that does go to areas where products are produced and we can track and ensure ourselves through some verification that there are health and safety standards being applied and in fact the materials are being repurposed. I think that, that some of that's still okay. But your um, observation that there is a domestic economic development opportunity here is completely missed by all governments. We have, unfortunately, producer responsibility starts at creating, it's important, but they start at creating a, a responsibility for collection and they don't dictate how it's to be used and where. And I think those standards are critical because at some point, if you start thinking about adding carbon pricing and just carbon disclosure, it makes no sense to be shipping um, ships back, you know, filled with air and light plastics back overseas to, to Southeast Asia and some of those areas. But we need to come up with an economic development plan just as much as an environmental plan. Your observations are, are, are correct. But I think recognizing that the blue box may have hit a plateau, what are these other measures for what we're not, cap how, what do we need to do to be able to, 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 to do better, to, to um, in, increase our performance and reduction avoidance um, reuse, all of those things need to be employed, for sure. Very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lots of opportunity. I mean, I guess maybe I'm still an optimist. There's just a tremendous amount of opportunity. Um, yeah, uh, well, so thanks for mentioning the plastics registry. That's something that we're working on. And it should actually also help across different provinces and territories for the collection of information rather than everyone having their own separate registries and databases so it's a bit of one of those finicky things that is it's not um 
you know, one of those wonderful sellable things to say that we're doing, but I think it is one of the fundamental building blocks to do better on, on, on how we manage plastics and to better understand the plastics that are out there. Uh, but I also think it's, it's important that we were, I think you came up with a question that we were talking about before. There are multiple pieces, right? The reuse economy, there's a lot of space for entrepreneurs too. So there's a government piece, you put in your plastics registries, you put in single use plastic bands. We had other parts that we were also working towards about recycled content and all of those pieces that, that need to come together. But then there's also the part of just, there are, there are opportunities for entrepreneurs and you do see them developing in different areas where they, they come up with the ideas of how to do things. And I'll give one quick example. I was talking with someone in Nova Scotia they pull, out, they pull out ghost gear. Because a lot of what we're talking about right now is consumer packaging and plastics, but ghost gear is actually a huge source of plastic waste uh, for Canada along all of our coasts. They were collecting it, and then they actually had someone that was creating patio furniture out of it. So that's entrepreneurial too. And I'm not saying that's a full answer, but I just think that there are opportunities out there for people too. Great. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the next question. about uh, the possibility of extended merchant responsibility. We talk about the producers and we were unable to access them, but uh, the point of sale, uh, when you go into a, a, a grocery store, reams and reams of the plastic bags off the rolls. And those are choices that those merchants make they could be doing something else and we shouldn't be uh, allowing that as a, a, a sort of a back door or a, a, a kind of drain that we, we aren't capturing. That, that, that it's just, it seems that also I have a greengrocer I go to, they're still giving out plastic bags. So I'm wondering, is there another avenue that they're able to purchase them, Sub Rosa? to be able to continue at this point in time to continue to give plastic bags to merchants, uh, to, to consumers, excuse me. Merchant responsibility. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. Um, the retailers um, and the merchants certainly have a tremendous opportunity. They are kind of on the front lines between the consumer and many of the, of the producers and the brand holders of, of goods, goods that they sell. Um, luckily, uh, many of them actually have their own brands that, and they get captured by producer responsibilities. So they're not scot-free, if you will. Um, and I think what provincial governments are trying to do is think about that um, in their definition of what gets covered under producer responsibility to try to think about um, those other plastics and other uh, products are quite common. The other area that was virtually untouched until about five years ago was online sales. You can imagine the growth of Amazon and Wayfair and they're endless. Um, you know, they steal a large part of the market share and the governments had to go back and retool producer responsibility and redefine it um, because previously it, you had to have bricks and mortar or some office in the jurisdiction, but now they, they've redefined it to capture online sales as well. And that was critical because effectively the retailers that had stores were captured by the regulation, but Amazon wasn't. And that made no sense. So, so governments, as I say, are always kind of behind the eight ball a little bit. They're trying to catch up, but they have done some good things recognizing that to cast the net wide is the best way to apply that policy. Thank you very much. Another question? Let's have one from the back. Hi, thanks, uh, thanks panel for the discussion. I wanted to ask a question around picking up on the topic of greenwashing and waste literacy for citizens and consumers. Um, is there a work on, say, at the provincial level or across provinces in terms of collaboration on what is the collection and end of life management, so collection, sorting, recycling, and all of that in terms of the Canada's infrastructure along all those steps across different provinces because from my perspective i'm visiting from montreal every time i move a borough 
um, the recycling rules are different and I work in sustainability and still I get confused by what is recyclable in my new address. And I wonder if it's a similar issue in other um, provinces or in other municipalities. So I'd be really curious to know what industry and government can work on together to simplify that message and simplify that system for citizens across the country. And I think maybe it would also help in terms of helping citizens understand um, how to spot greenwashing, uh, especially around claims like what is what is recyclable, what is compostable, and, and all the complexities behind that. Yeah, we'd love to hear your opinion on um, initiatives or um, yeah, ongoing work on that. Hard question. <laughs> well, it's a good. It, I, I can t take it a little bit. I I mean, I think I think about that. I agree with you 100%. I mean, we need to harmonize waste management at least across. In Toronto, it's city, or it's, sorry, in Ontario, it's city by city. I think that maybe is going to change, and it will be harmonized across the province. It would be nice to harmonize it across the country. But you're right. Right now, it's crazy. We actually do a home waste audit as part of the UAT trash team. I recognize people in this room who have done it. Thank you. Um, and we basically have people, and we try to get people from all over, at least Canada, if not North America, to basically join. And part of it, you know, for the first week, people just do as usual and they put their garbage where they think their garbage goes. And then in that second week, we have them actually look online at how you recycled right. So what goes in the blue bin, black bin, green bin? Do you even have those bins? And then they report back. And then in their webinar, when they come back after they've now tried to do it correctly and reduce their waste, we show people how different it is across. And even though I know this, I'm still like always kind of shocked by what I see. And I think that... Um, and so it's and it's more than greenwashing. It's just like how can we uh, use our waste management correctly in order? To, this would how much you maybe know this. If we all recycled correct, if we all put the right things in the black bin and the blue bin, how much more do you think would be recycled? Oh, there's probably a leakage of about 35, 40 percent to the black bag that is recyclable. Yeah. yeah so the numbers would change, but I. That is one of the benefits and the goals of producer responsibility, even at a provincial level, is to create provincial programs. So to use Ontario as an example, prior to having producer responsibility when it was just the municipalities who are responsible for their own jurisdictional programs, they had autonomy in terms of deciding what's in the box, what's out of the box, where does it go. Um, we had 247 different programs in Ontario alone. And they all, no one looked alike. The, in, when we transition over to the producers, we, are, we give them the jurisdiction of Ontario and we offload the responsibility of the municipalities. So now the producers get to design a system for Ontario. They can dissolve those service borders in the municipalities, you know, conceptually. Um, so they have some economies of scale. They can standardize the materials that are collected across the province. And those are dictated by the targets that they have to hit. And in fact, some of them are looking to replicate the same program in Quebec and BC and Alberta. So that, again, because Canada is such a big geography, it needs big supply, big economies of scale for it to actually work um, efficiently, cost effectively. So they know they have, to, they have to work with other provinces in order to get those supplies to push the value up of the materials. Um, and to, to really help them actually hit the targets that are prescribed in the regulation. So EPR will address some of that standardization issue. One problem, challenge, opportunity, uh, positive. Um, most of EPR is focused on what we consume and generate in our homes, residential only. They do not scope out those responsibilities to what we bring into our universities, our campuses, are you know in our parks so we're working now across the country to say you need the whole system not just what goes into a home in your blue box but what do i use in my office what do i what do i produce in my school etc so open spaces so we need to cast the net farther in terms of what gets covered and there's industry pushback because that's more material more cost in the system but but we've, we've done a really pretty good job of targeting what we produce and, and generate in our homes, but we've got to extend that to the commercial and industrial sector as well. Right, yeah. We need the, more optimism like this. Optimism, Everyone. that's gonna hope. Isn't that the word of the year? <laughs> I, I, I like it. Um, if I can just jump in quickly, it was just also um, to talk about the fact, and I, I think the Dr. Rochman, the Richmond has been part of them, but 
we've done consultations also on how to standardize labeling too, because I feel like you need a degree when you're looking at everything that's going in about like, you know, what, what goes into which bin. And we actually had a kid at one of the farmer's markets who tried to test it out. He tested people by putting a whole bunch of products and gave them a timer to sort out what was recyclable and what wasn't just even within Toronto. And, and most people couldn't get it. So that is something that, that we've definitely talked with people about, about um, industry and, and advocates and scientists about the labeling piece. Can I say one more thing about that as a consumer? Because I don't think we say this enough um, uh, to, to Julie's point. When, don't get lured as a consumer. The big decision, one of the big decisions on what package to choose is it's, it's a billboard for the consumer, for the producer to sell you something. So we need to get savvier as consumers to not get lured into that. You don't want the package, you want what's in it. So don't let the, you know, shiny colors and the nice font and whatever, you know, someone's mug and an influencer. Like, we gotta get smarter uh, and really basic about understanding what is it that we value about what we purchase. It's not the package ever. That's one and done. And when you have it for 10 seconds, you don't care. It's in the recycling bin, hopefully, or the garbage bag. It's what, you, what you're what you wanting to purchase is inside that package. And so that's what we need to focus on. So, you know, I think there's a, there's a responsibility for consumers to get a little bit brighter about what we're buying and be more deliberate because you vote with your dollar and that's paramount. That's going to move industry faster than any regulation will. I promise you that. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from online. Um, and I'll read it out. Uh, this question is about the comment on ghost gear. I'm from Newfoundland. Oh, I should know this. <laughs> we have a group <laughs> called Clean Harvest Initiative who cleans the harvest around the island. He has to fight to get funding. He has a track record that is very impressive for cleanup. So we need Canada to offer more funding. Owner Sean has done incredible work, but cannot do this alone. Why is it so difficult to get funding for NGOs in Canada? Um, well, if I can jump in, I actually think there's been quite a bit of different funds, but sometimes it's also about knowledge about how to navigate them all. Um, and interestingly, I think the ghost here funding comes from uh, fisheries. Uh, so I don't think it actually always comes from Environment Canada. But what I would recommend for that person is to reach out to their member of parliament who can actually do a search of the different funds. Because when I was talking about the group that I was visiting in Nova Scotia, they actually had received federal funding for the work they were doing on cleaning up ghost gear. So I'm not going to say it's perfect and I, you know, I'm open to the feedback on it, but I'd also say it's worth getting a check on what the available ones are because there are, there are some for non-governmental organizations for sure. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and then back to, okay, yes, please go. Circling back to just previous, where you were talking about individual responsibility. And this is, uh, I'm curious to know, is this happening elsewhere? In my neighborhood, there's a shop, and there are quite a few across Toronto, actually, that is a non-packaging shop yeah. space. So when I go, I bring paper bags and glass jars and, and whatever I've got, and I fill it with product that's in bins and it's not everything but it's a lot of things and uh the price is actually n comparable it's not a lot more uh and it's made a huge difference like i haven't purchased shampoo for example in three years and how many plastic bottles would that have been and i i'm really uh conscious that we can't it's not just about the individual that the but but it it helps to be able to know that that exists now, I'm in my bubble, you know, in your experience, is this happening elsewhere? Are, and what kind of incentives are there for small businesses who take on this, this uh, you know, um, representation, like, like they're really uh, modeling something that could, you know, that should be happening at grocery stores that isn't, uh, you know, have you seen these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can, I can respond to that. Um, uh, there is tremendous in the interest in retailers um, to try to uh, offer 
plastic free packaging or packaging free zones in stores. There's experiments around dispensaries and refilleries in sections. There's whole stores at this point, they're mostly boutique. Uh, but the experiment that we're doing by way of an example is got Walmart and and Metro and so he's a farm boy. These are international, if, if not national, national, if not international grocery stores. And they're trying to figure out, you know, where in store. And they've started with, well, the deli, we have full control. We don't have a vendor. The deli is within our space and, and that's one area we can start. But the intent is to look in other areas of the store to say, where else could we apply this? So I will say there's really great examples. And this is not because you know, the federal government is coming down on them with regulation only. Of course they feel that pressure, but they're doing it because consumers are going to respond. And what I, this is being recorded and hopefully they'll never see it, but uh, sorry, no disrespect to the organizers, but, <laughs> but I, I think, you know, what they've said to me is we don't expect to make more money. Like our, one of our objectives is not to sell more of this category because it's in reusables, but we don't want to lose money either. And I thought that was interesting. So their expectation is if we can keep sales level, if we're asking the consumer, you know, to choose a reusable option in this case, can we just sell, you know, the same amount that we did before? And I thought that was a reasonable ask of them. And so that's where it's really important for us to go and support them. And when they make an attempt, they'll watch. They're, t they're, 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 they're really measuring every single response they get from a consumer. And that will be the tipping point, whether they continue it and expand it or whether they shut it down. So we, again, I just have to emphasize the point, when you're seeing an attempt or some, some, some real non-greenwashing activities, support them as best as you possibly can because they'll do more of it. And if I can just jump in from like, this is more on the larger side, but I stay in hotels a lot because of my work. So I'm out of town a lot. And I've noticed that a lot of hotels have started switching to, instead of having the little bottles for your different shampoos, conditioners, and the like, a lot of them actually are now having um, like reusable containers for it. Sorry, I was making the little pumping thing because that's like where the shampoo is. But um, it's something that I noticed happened over the past year, especially. It's been happening across the board. And I think it's really good to give good feedback when you see that kind of thing. Great, thank you. Any more questions? questions in the front? Yeah, I, I've been noticing that the supermarkets... Oh, for the are, online audience. Oh, yeah, the supermarkets, I've been seeing that they've been use, uh, actually going more to packaging than less. Like, um, I don't know if you... I, like, for instance, mushrooms. You can't, you know, they want to sell more. They find it more convenient to put packaging and then they don't have to deal with the customer who wants three mushrooms. They just have to buy half a pound or whatever it is. And a lot of things are like that. You, you, bread and um, all kinds of things are in, in packages of, of six or 12 or, and, and vegetables too. I mean, it's really much harder to get individual product. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I know apples and oranges and all that, you can get them, but it, it's it's obvious that they're really looking for ways to make it easier for them to sell more and at the same time as I know they're trying to do these other things but I, I'm I'm just thinking that they're really uh, going to be finding it hard to give up on that I mean you have to buy a muffin separately I mean we all did it in the old days when you went to a bakery you don't get a package of muffins you get you buy them in a bag or whatever but now of course they want to make it so that they can keep them for longer and or sell you at least uh, you know a certain quantity so that's one thing that really I've noticed and and, and another thing I just want to ask you about is, is the way that recycling has happened in the last I don't know if it's 10 years ago when they went to these large bins or the bins that we're using instead of the box. Well, I remember saying to Gord Perks, how, how are you gonna sell this stuff if you put everything together, the paper and the jars and the cans and all the mess, everything is, is garbage after you, and you see it in the, in the big uh, depots that, that the city brings everything there and they just put mountains and mountains of stuff. And I don't know how they ever get that sorted out. So how can that be useful for recycling and selling, reselling these things? I mean, I don't understand how it works. 
I, I can try to deem, I can take your second question first, if that's okay, and sure. let others maybe take the single use um, items. So the rationale to giving you giant rollout bins is really simply the municipality trying to give you more space and opportunity to put recyclables in that giant bin than fill your black bag. You know, that's really what it's about. They just want to give you as much opportunity as possible. Municipalities, when they start their programs 25 years ago, had a decision to make. Do I? The trends have shown that convenience is king, and the more that I ask the consumer to sort a black box, a red box, a blue box, the more that I get you to sort at home, the trend was the less material overall they got back. Maybe people got frustrated or they didn't want to take the time or whatever the case was. And in experiments, when they combined everything into one, one bin, it was seen as more convenient. The trade-off was now I have a mix of materials that needs additional labor and sorting. And that's how we got mechanical recycling because the diversity of, of packaging that was there and the amount of it meant that you could never manually sort that feasibly. It just wouldn't work. So we started to, to have these, these mechanical systems in place. So you're right, it is a trade-off um, and that's where they continue to make the decision that I would rather have dirtier material than have less of it. And the way to mitigate that is to apply more labor, more mechanical sorting to try to get it down to the streams that are valuable and sellable, plastics, metals, newspapers. So that's the management decision that municipalities have. It's not an easy one, but part of that is because we the, the packaging design is happening so fast on the other end that they're just trying to design a system you know, it takes 25 years to design a system and about six months for a new package to come online. So they're never going to match up. Recycling programs will always be delayed because the pace at which we design new packaging is just so much quicker. So they're always sort of years behind, unfortunately, and that's that's the reality of global production and local management. It's, 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 it's definitely a challenge, an opportunity. On the single use thing, um, I think that the choices that, um, you know, when we start, COVID was terrible for increasing packaging for sure, yeah. because we were all afraid to touch everything and touch each other and, and, and all of us touching the same thing. So, you know, the packaging and the use of plastics and wrap certainly escalated over that time. Um, and I think as we're shortening supply chain, so as we look to local growers, expand the footprint in stores that have local produce, they don't have to transport. And so the packaging around transport is, is not as, as, as much of an issue if you're bringing it from Chile. So part of, of you know, we, you can't sell, you know, single blueberries. It's not going to happen. So you're going to need some packaging. So the question is, how do you account for um, smaller families, you know, uh, some, uh, populations that are not, that are, you know, more single people? And the stores are, are, reconfiguring themselves around that reality and it's a change every day but you're right there are sections of the store what makes me nuts is when i go to buy you know parsley or some kind of herb i've got to buy four pounds of it and i need it for one meal and it always goes bad and i, I and so you know but i but i think um you know it, it sounds silly but going to your manager and just saying hey can you can you do something about this mushroom package like I, like i just i need half of this and half goes bad every time and, and just keep you know giving them that feedback. But you're right, that's one of those challenges where they have to think about shortening their supply chains and then dealing with the fact that, that families are smaller. Right, and, uh, um, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, it's endless, the problems, it's really, I admire you for sticking with it for so many years. <laughs> I remember talking to you 25 years ago. Oh, no. It's true. Yeah. We've well, come a long way. Wonderful. Well, that's all the time we have for today. But if you do have any lingering questions, please stay for the refreshments um, during the reception, um, if our speakers are still available. And um, thank you. Can we thank, give them another round of applause? Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Thank you.